Now, wherever you are, whoever you are, if you're standing for the Lord Jesus, it's going to cost you something. And if you're trying to get by without paying, my brother, I want to tell you it's going to have to be put on your account because somewhere down the line you're going to pay for standing for the Lord Jesus. And if you're not paying anything, well, it must be that you're not standing. And there are a lot of Christians, they're cold and different today. They're not willing to pay the price. Now, any preacher, they'll pay the price. And a lot of them are paying it, let me tell you. And thank God for men like that that are in the ministry. We've got too many jellyfish that are trying to be Christian leaders. And they're only Christian leaders at banquets and where the going is easy. And when it's sitting on a committee or they can be elected to something and they can have some sort of prominence. But when it comes to getting down and standing for the Lord Jesus and cost them something, you can't find them. They're not there. And John, he says, I'm your brother. <laughs> brother in Christ, yes, been a partaker in the persecution. And John is on the Isle of Patmos because he wasn't willing to trim his message over yonder in the city of Ephesus. And the Roman authorities came around and said, Now, to be smart, if you just tone your message down, you're just being a little dogmatic here. And you're speaking out a little too plainly. And you know that you ought to try to get along with people. And you certainly should read the book, How to Make Friends and Influence People. That's the procedure. But John, you know, just didn't have access to the book on how to make friends and influence people. And he got in trouble with the Roman authorities. And they put him over on the Isle of Patmos. He's exiled. That was a lonely island a rugged, volcanic island off the coast of Asia Minor. It was about ten miles long, six miles wide. A lot of beach, I'm sure, there. But believe me, he had a difficult time. But John was there because he stood for the Word of God and a testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, today are you his brother and partaker? He was our brother and partaker with you in the persecution. Now, the interesting thing is, another thing here that's very important, kingdom and patience in Jesus. Now, what kingdom is he talking about? Well, may I say to you, and I hope today that some of the brethren that think since I'm dispensational, that I have no place for the kingdom in this present age. May I say that we do have a place for the kingdom in this present age. The only way to get into the kingdom today is to be born again. The Lord Jesus said to Nicodemus, Well, you can't even enter the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And old Nicodemus thought he was one of the leaders in the kingdom, but he wasn't. Now, the way you get in is by the new birth. And today we have the kingdom of heaven in mystery form. You have a place where he's sowing seed in the world. They're good seed. And there are bad seed being sown today, too, by the way. And when it falls on good ground, the good seed really will come up. Now, the whole point is, are you in the kingdom today? You're in the kingdom if the seed fell on good ground and has brought forth fruit in your heart and in your life. And today, you're a member of the kingdom if you've received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Now, that's the present status of the kingdom. Now, he's not talking about the kingdom that the Lord Jesus is going to establish when he comes to this earth in his second coming. That's going to be a kingdom that will be of power and great glory. And he'll be reigning here personally. But we're not in that kingdom now. Certainly you're aware of that. But that doesn't mean there isn't a present status of the kingdom. It is in existence today. You get in it by the new birth. And as someone has said, that the kingdom today is what John says here, kingdom and patience. You and I are in the kingdom and patience. We're waiting for the consummation, you see, of all things. The Lord is moving toward the day when he will establish his kingdom and power and glory. And we're in the day when he's calling men and women by faith and placing them in the kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, that's the picture that's before us here, you see. And that's not all that I should mention before we leave this. He uses the name Jesus here twice. I think that we should call your attention to that. John, who has given us the most exalted 
picture of the Lord Jesus. In fact, his gospel, written last, was to set him forth as the Son of God. And yet, in the gospel of John, he's called Jesus. You note that, will you? Just turn to the gospel of John after the broadcast and turn the pages, and you notice it's Jesus, Jesus. His human name is used, and yet he's presented there as the Son of God. John said that. John said, many other things did Jesus, which are not written in this book, but these are written that she might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Now, when John got to the book of Revelation, he presents him here now, the resurrected, glorified Christ. But wait a minute. He calls him Jesus, the human name, you see. This one who was the man of Galilee, the carpenter, the babe of Bethlehem, this is the one who is the Son of God. That's the thing that John is presenting to us here. And so he calls him Jesus. And you'll find that'll be a familiar name. And so here in verse 9, twice we have that. Now I must move on. Verse 10 and 11 I've put together. I'm reading my translation. Watch your Bible very carefully. I was in the Spirit in the Lord's day and heard behind me a great sound as of a war trumpet saying, What you're seeing, write into a book and send to the seven churches unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, under Pergamos, under Thyatira, under Sardis, under Philadelphia, and under Laodicea. Now, what's happening in this particular book is that the Holy Spirit is performing his office work in this day. What is that? John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he's now going to be given a vision of the glorified Christ. That's exactly what the Lord Jesus said and John recorded it back in the 16th chapter. The Lord Jesus said, I've got many things, but you cannot receive them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he'll lead you into all truth. And he's going to take the things of mine and show them unto you. And that's the book of Revelation. I believe that, and I want to say this kindly, and I'm going to say it, this is it. The book of Revelation is, to many people, a closed book. I quoted the other day the thing that someone told me their preacher had said. Well, you're not to study the book of Revelation. It leads to fanaticism. Nobody knows what it means anyway. Well, that's not a very kind thing to say, is it? Well, maybe what I'm going to say may not be so kind, but I don't want to be unkind, but I'm going to say it, and it's this. The reason today that men do not understand the book of Revelation is just simply this. This is a book that reveals Jesus Christ, and you can't see him unless the Holy Spirit takes the things of Christ and show them unto you. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of Christ. They're spiritually discerned, and their foolishness unto him Neither can he know them. Now, that's the picture, and that's the reason that the book of Revelation is avoided by so many, because John was told he was in the Spirit, and that means the Holy Spirit. And that is the place you and I have to be if we're going to understand this book. Now, that's not all. It was in the Lord's day. Now, what does he mean by the Lord's day? Well... I think that the Lord's day here means, well, it doesn't mean the day of the Lord. A great many have attempted to make it mean that. But it's not the day of the Lord. He's not being projected into that day. And yet he writes a great deal about it in the book of Revelation. But you can't twist the words that he used to mean that. Now, there are others that have tried to make it mean something else. I personally believe that the Lord's day here is the first day of the week. That's the Lord's day. You see, that's the important day for us today. We do not observe the Old Testament 
legalistic Mosaic Sabbath day. That's Saturday. I constantly get lettuce from some wise acre that's always saying, can you show that the Sabbath day was changed to Sunday? I can't show it. But I can tell you something that will really pull a rug out from it under you, and it's this. The Sabbath day wasn't changed. Sabbath day was done away with. It came to an end, if you please. You see, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. And today, we don't observe the Sabbath day. Why? Because it belongs to the law. It's the Mosaic system. It was a covenant between God and the children of Israel. It's to be restored. But it's not for believers today. We observe the Lord's day. We don't take the end of the week, the seventh day. We take the first day of the week. We start with him. I think that's the way people ought to give today. I do not believe we're under the tithe either. I think that the tithe was always a man taking a tenth off of the bottom of what he had. I think by the same principle of the Sabbath day, we observe now not the last day but the first day, you give God first, you see. And somebody says, I might not have anything left for myself. That's all right. If you starve like that, you couldn't starve for a better cause than that. You put him first. You and I are living in the day when he's either our Lord or he's not our Lord. What is this little cliche today? Jesus is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Well, I'm not sure, but what that's a very good cliche. I think it's probably true if he's not your Lord. Well, he's not your Lord, is he? And if he is your Lord, you do put him first. And you recognize the first day of the week. And you also put him first in your giving. I'm not worried about this matter of the Sabbath day, because I think most instructed Christians today observe the first day of the week. But my problem is to get them to see that they are to put him first in their giving. What we do today is we give God what's left over. And we give God what fits into our income tax. It'll help it out. But that's not the way you're to give to him. The way you're to give to him where it counts is you put him first. He comes first. John says, I was in the Spirit in the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great sound as of a war trumpet. That's what it was. And this is a book, by the way, we're going to have a lot of marching in it, a lot of riding in it, and a great deal of war in the book of Revelation. And so he hears a war trumpet. And the thing that's always been interesting to me is the trumpet is saying. Well, that's the thing that's interesting. Here's a trumpet that's talking. It's saying something. Well, you've heard the expression. They say, that fellow makes the trumpet talk. Well, I don't think he does, but I don't want to argue with young people about any hot trumpet today. But I do want to say this, that the trumpet in Revelation talks. Here's one that really talks. And he says, I heard a great sound as of a war trumpet saying, not playing or singing. And the interesting thing is, what you are seeing, write promptly into a book. Again, may I say, this is God's great television program. This is where you see it as well as you hear it. And it was given that way. Now, friends, we're coming into that which is rich today and real. We're coming to the wonderful vision that we have of the Lord Jesus, that John saw the things which thou hast seen. That is the one that we're going to look at today. At least we get started. We'll be here for several days. Now, will you notice, I'll begin reading at verse 10 in my translation. I do not recommend it. It's no substitute for the authorized version. In fact, the matter is, I don't think any of them that are out today are substitutes for our authorized version. And if you want to know why we cannot, nor will we accept, none of these modern translations as a substitute. Now, don't misunderstand. I have them all in my library. In fact, the matter is, in my study at home, I keep them right before me. Because every now and then I like to see what they say about a certain passage of Scripture, and I find that they are generally weak at the point of doctrine where they are weak. doesn't make any difference how much Greek they know. They don't seem to know enough doctrine to put over 
a great many of the words. But now listen to this, will you please? I was in the Spirit in the Lord's day, heard behind me a great sound as of a war trumpet saying, What you're seeing, write into a book and send to the seven churches under Ephesus, under Smyrna, under Pergamos, under Thyatira, under Sardis, under Philadelphia, under Laodicea. Now, we were talking about that. John was told that what he sees, he's to write down. You know, the hardest thing in the world is to write down what you see. It's bad enough to have to write down what somebody else has written. But to write down what you see, it means you've got to put it in language. Now, it's actually a translation. And the book of Revelation was a translation before it ever got started. For the very simple reason, he had to translate it out of the realm of sight into the realm of sound. That is, what you see, write it down so it can be spoken. In other words, John didn't have along with him his brownie, Kodak. He didn't have with him a camera, didn't have a moving picture machine. But nevertheless, what you have here is a moving picture, and it's told with words. And this is the original television program that we have here, so that he used to write down what he saw. Now, he's to send this message to the seven churches, and these seven churches are identified. When we take up each message separately, which we shall do in chapters 2 and 3, we talk about each one of these places, because I believe it's helpful to understand the message to know something about the place. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Here are the seven places. I personally like to visit these places. I'm told that they are today in ruins. That's all that's there. I'd like to go and see, though. I think it'd be interesting to see the sights of these places. Now, when John wrote, Asia was Asia Minor, as we know it today. It was one of the most thriving places economically. It was the center of a great culture. The nomic poets of the Greeks came from this section. I remember in college of reading in Greek a great deal of what these nomic poets had written. And every last one of them came out of Asia Minor. A great culture was there. And excavations and the ruins that have been left all reveal that it was a very high state of culture and civilization that existed in this area at this time. For instance, Ephesus was a great center commercially, a great center religiously, a great center politically. And the churches that were begun here, apparently Paul the Apostle was responsible for all of them. He was the missionary who came into this area from the school of Tyrannus there in Ephesus. The word sounded out for two years, and Paul never visited, for instance. He told the Colossians they'd never seen him face to face. I don't think any of these churches had seen Paul, but many of the members had, because they were saved when they went down to Ephesus, which was the seaport and the main city of all of them. When they went down there, they heard this man preach, and they heard him preach the gospel. And multitudes of them at that time turned to Christ. I believe Paul had his most profitable ministry spiritual in the city of Ephesus. And out of that, there was the outgrowth of these seven churches. Now, by John's day, it was necessary to send in a warning, because even then they were beginning to depart from the faith. In fact, Laodicea, way up in the interior, a very wealthy city, that church, even in that day, had apostatized. And it becomes the picture of the church in our day the apostate church. Now, these messages that we're going to get to the seven churches are actually the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor that the Lord Jesus sent to them. And here's something directly from him. I like to, every now and then, and I've done it several times in several different places. I remember back at Winona Lake last summer. It was Sunday night in the Billy Sunday Tabernacle. I said, if you have your Bible, turn to the epistle to the Ephesians. And I heard Bibles rustling, and I said, now I'm sure that I fooled you. 
most of you have turned to the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians. Well, the word in Epheso, in the epistle to the Ephesians, Paul wrote, is actually not there. Although I believe it went to Ephesus, it's actually not in the better manuscripts, so you can't be dogmatic about that one. But the real epistle to the Ephesians is found in the second chapter of the book of Revelation. Here is the real epistle to the Ephesians, and you find it in Revelation 2. Now, we'll find that these are direct messages of our Lord to the churches in existence in that day. We're also going to see that they're direct messages to you and to me also today. They're very pertinent. They're right up to date. Now, will you notice, as we come to verses 12 and 13, and now we are going to see the vision, the first one that John saw on the Isle of Patmos. And I believe it is the most wonderful one of all. It certainly is more applicable to us today than any that you have in the book. Will you notice it? And I turned to see the voice which was speaking with me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands, one like to a son of man, clothed with a garment reaching to the foot, girt about the breast with a golden girdle. Now let me make several general statements about these two verses, because they're quite wonderful. First of all, he says, I turned to see the voice which was speaking with me. Isn't that a strange expression? But you're going to find now John is giving you a pattern that he'll follow that'll help you in interpreting a great deal of what he says. Now he says, I turned to see the voice. Did you ever see a voice? I heard a fellow say that he saw a dream walking. And he and I were in college together. A girl went across the campus. He says, there goes a dream walking. He married her. <laughs> May I say to you that he found out there wasn't a dream walking later on. I think he thought he had a nightmare from the experience that he had. But nevertheless, this that John saw is a voice. He says, I turned and saw a voice. Now, I ask you the question, how can you see a voice? Well, you have to... Learn now to interpret John. John is using the word voice for the person that had the voice. That's called metonymy in rhetoric. It's a very fine way of expressing yourself, especially when you're dealing with visions and dealing with this type of thing. Now, if you'll keep that in mind, it's going to help you understand a great deal more that's going to be coming along. I turn to see a voice. Well, immediately somebody picked John up and said, well, now you didn't really see a voice, did you? John said, yes, I did, because I saw the one that was speaking. And when you see the one speaking, you see the voice, you see. That is metonymy. Now let's notice something else that's general here. He sees one that is clothed with a garment. And the garment identifies this one as the great high priest the great high priest. He is also called a son of man. Now, I'll talk about this tomorrow, about the son of man. But right now, the son of man, a son of man, it's not the, the son of man here, a son of man, it's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I say that today categorically because I intend tomorrow to follow through on this. But what I'm interested in today is the first thing that he saw. When he turned to see a voice, he says, When I turned, I saw what? A son of man? No. I saw seven golden lampstands. Not a candlestick, but separate lampstands. These are what would be to us today. We call them floor lamps. That's what they are, what they were. Seven floor lamps. Now, immediately, we see that we have a scene that is not only a vision of the high priest, and that high priest is the Lord Jesus Christ, but we are also taken into some very familiar territory, and that is the tabernacle that Moses built. We are here in the presence of a lampstand. Now, with this difference, back that was one golden lampstand, and it had seven prongs on it and seven lights on each prong. But here... They're separate, and the reason for that is that these lamps will be identified for us, and there's no use 
for me to beat around the bush on this. Let me just say it, because John's going to say it later on, that the lampstands are the churches. Seven churches, seven lampstands. A lampstand for each church. Well, that follows, does it not? The church is the light of the world. He said to his own, ye are the light of the world. You and you and you, you're the light of the world. You're a lampstand. Now, the thing that interests me is he's walking in the midst of the lampstand. Now, friends, I've got to talk about this a great deal as we go along. It's going to be important to these seven churches. It's very important to you and me today. Now, here's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as he is today, where he is right now. I hope that you don't have around your place a picture of Jesus as he walked 1,900 years ago. Now, if you want a picture of him, you get it here. This is the way he looks today. Here's where he is today, and here's what he's doing. He's walking in the midst of the lampstands, and he's doing what the high priest does. Aaron was the high priest, and Aaron had charge of the lampstand. Now, that lampstand, I believe, is the finest picture that you have of Christ back in the tabernacle. You see, he was the light of the world. Now he said to us, you're the light of the world. As I am in the world, you are going to be in the world. And if you are true to me, if the world hated me, it's going to hate you also. You will occupy exactly the same position that I do. Now, the lampstands speak of the church, speak of believers today, speak of you. Now, he's walking in the midst of them. Now, friends, what's he doing? And he's the only one who had charge of the lampstand. I'll not take time today to turn to those scriptures, because I want to talk about that lampstand. But Aaron... He put in the oil when it needed oil. And he also trimmed the wick. He was given snuffers also. When the thing started smoking, why, Aaron went in there and he just snuffed it out. He put it out. Now, the Lord Jesus today is walking in the midst of his church. Churches, if you please. And believers. And every now and then, here's a believer that... Well, he's out of oil. <laughs> what does that mean? He's not filled with the Holy Spirit. The Lord wants to fill him because he says, The Father and I, we want to get fruit from you. And the only way to get fruit from you, you've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so he wants to fill us with the Holy Spirit. And so he sees it to oil. He's very much interested in that today because he knows that you and I can't produce anything, only the Spirit working through us. So therefore, he's interested in the oil supply. He's interested in something else. You see, every now and then, you and I sort of smoke up the place. Yes, we do. My, I tell you, believers can be the meanest people in the world sometime, can't they? Some of the meanest people I've ever met weren't outside the church. They're in the church. I know some church members, frankly, I'm afraid of. They're mean, friends. You know, they smoke up the place. What does he do? He trims the wick. And sometimes he sends to many of us, he sends suffering. Sometimes we're not giving as bright a light as he thinks that we ought to. I have a letter here on my desk from a young fellow. He says that I had a great influence in his life. When I met him, he was going to a Bible school and had not made any definite decisions. He was a plantation owner from Arkansas, rather wealthy fellow, never had anything to worry about. He says I shook him up when he heard me in Memphis, and he then studied for the ministry, he went to Dallas Seminary, graduated there. He became pastor of a church, but he didn't need to worry about the salary. He ran two big plantations, finally got tired of fooling with them, sold them. Just got a letter and a picture of his daughter. You know what happened? She's killed over near Jackson, Mississippi in an automobile accident. I wish you could read the letter. May I say to you, he said, I'm not complaining, and he says, I'm not even asking God why. He says, I know that God's going to use this and is using it. I don't think the fellow was smoking up the place. He's a lovely fellow. I do think this, that when you've got plenty of money, you just get settled down and you get comfortable and you don't really do as much for God. I held a meeting for him when I was back in Dallas. I tried to stir him up. I couldn't stir him up. But I tell you, that one today who walks in the midst of the lamp stands, he sometimes reaches down, friends, and he trims a lamp. Hurts, doesn't it? Oh, how it hurts. Why does he do it? Because he hates us? No, he loves us. Does he do it because he likes to see you hurt and he's sadistic? No, he wants a brighter light. That's what he wants. And he trim your lamp, me trim my lamp, my friend. 
He walks in the midst of the lampstand. Now, that lampstand was the most beautiful picture of Christ in the tabernacle. It was made there of one piece, gold, solid gold. Speaks of the deity of Christ. It was beaten work. He came down here, died on a cross. Men crucified God, friends. You say, you don't mean that. I do mean that. And you know what? If men could get at God today, they'd put him off his throne. I tell you, if they could drop an atomic bomb on him, they'd do it. You read what's coming out of Russia today. They said they'd do it. Back to the matter is, Joe Stalin said before he died at one of the May Day celebrations in Red Square, he says, if there be a God, let him stick his head out of heaven. We'll blow it all. <laughs> yes, they did. They crucified God yonder. Beaten work was that lampstand. Now, you and I can't know much about him except on the top of the lampstand there were bowls, seven bowls. And by the way, that was a very beautiful lampstand, beaten into the shape of almonds. Almond and almond blossom, and at the top of each one of these seven prongs, there was a great big blossom open. Into that blossom was placed the lamp, the little bowl, you know, the little olive oil lamp. It was put there. And that light speaks of the Holy Spirit, you see. And the thing was that the lampstand held up the lights, but the lights, in turn, they showed and revealed the beauty of the lampstand. You see, the Lord Jesus said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit into the world. When he comes, he won't speak of himself. He'll take the things of mine and show them unto you. And you see, it's only the Holy Spirit in the holy place that can take the things of Christ and reveal them unto us today. His beauty, his glory, the beaten work, if you please, the one that was crucified, the one that's God manifests in the flesh. Now, don't get excited if the man down on Pershing Square says he doesn't believe Jesus was God. What would you expect him to say? He hadn't been in the holy place. And if a bishop in San Francisco says he doesn't believe in the deity of Jesus, don't get excited, friends. You've got to go inside the holy place. And you can't see the beauty of this lampstand unless you get in the light that's on top of it, the Holy Spirit. And so I'm not disturbed today by these men. I just know they haven't been on the inside. Now, some of you have. He's beautiful, isn't he? He's wonderful, is he not? But now... He's gone back yonder to heaven. He's the great high priest today. He's at God's right hand, just sitting there, twiddling his thumbs. Oh, no. Walking in the midst of the lampstand. What's he doing? Well, as Aaron went into the holy place and he trimmed the seven lamps on the lampstand, well, that's what the Lord Jesus is doing today. He's trimming those that are his own, if you please. Why? That they might burn brighter. He said, you're the light of the world. So that today he wants those that are his own to shine. And he has a message we'll find later on for these different churches that are representative here. He says, if you don't repent and you don't let me trim you and you don't let me put the oil of the Holy Spirit into your heart and life, then he said, I'm going to remove your lampstand. Now, do you want to go back? For the past 1,900 years, almost, and look at the history of the church. Well, during that particular period, may I say to you that he has been really removing lampstands. If you went today over to Asia Minor, where these churches were, he has absolutely, historically, literally removed their lampstands. There's no church today in Thyatira. There's no church in Sardis. They've disappeared. They've gone. Why? Well, he removed their lampstand because that's his function. That's his business. And believe me, friends, a church today that will not function, do what it's called to do, its lampstand will be removed. Now, friends, we are come today to this very wonderful vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. It, to my judgment, is one of the most wonderful visions, and up to the present, 
moment. It's the finest picture that we have of him. And if I may resort to this kind of a description without being irreverent, this is the latest picture that we have of Jesus. Now, if you think that at Christmas time, when you talk about a little baby born in Bethlehem, that he's a baby, you're wrong. That happened a long time ago. It was a pinpoint in history, but he grew up. And then, if you think he's the man of Galilee, well, he walked by the Sea of Galilee many times, 1,900 years ago. Well, he's not walking over there today any more than he's walking down the streets of Los Angeles. And he is by the Holy Spirit in Los Angeles, and I'm sure by the Sea of Galilee. But may I also add that he is not the man on the cross. If you think that if you have a crucifix and somehow or another there's a value to that, I say it to you very kindly. He's not on the cross today at all. And if you feel like that he's in the tomb, you're wrong. May I say that if you feel like that he's the one who for 40 days walked in a glorified body on this earth after his resurrection, you're wrong. He's not there in person. Where is he? Well, here is the picture of him. He's yonder in the Holy of Holies. He's yonder at God's right hand. And he is performing a ministry there today for the church. And the picture that we called attention to was he is the great high priest who is passed into the Holy of Holies, and he's performing a ministry there for us. Now we saw the seven golden lampstands. Those lampstands speak of the church. And we saw that he's in the midst of the lampstands. He's walking in the midst. This wonderful, glorified Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, yonder in heaven, actually is still walking among the lampstands. And when one refuses to give light, oh, he'll trim them. He'll pour in the oil of the Holy Spirit. But when they start smoking and are not clear cut, he'll remove them. Do you want a good example of that one right today that hurts there was a time in America, you don't have to go back too far to find this, because I can remember as a boy, and I'm not an old man, at least I don't think I am, but I can remember as a boy in the little town in which I live in West Texas, while we had, I think it was four churches in the town. I remember three of them, definitely, because I visited them all. My folk never went to church, but they sent me, and I just sort of divided my time. I didn't want any of them to feel bad, so I divided my time among them. I remember going to three, but I'm told there were four there. There on one corner of the little town, wasn't big, you see, on one corner there was a Methodist church, and that's where I went most of the time. Then on the other corner was a Baptist church, and on another corner was a Presbyterian church, and on another corner, I'm not sure, I think it was the Church of Christ. Now, there there were, four churches. Or maybe it was a Christian church. I don't recall just what, but the four was there. And the story that used to be told that one Sunday night, one church was singing the hymn, Will There Be Any Stars in My Crown? And the church on the other corner was singing, No, Not One. No, Not One. And then on the other corner, the other church was singing, That Will Be Glory For Me. Well, they were at each other's throats in those days. But do you know that there was a wonderful harmony about those churches? All those churches believed that the Bible was the Word of God. Not one of them ever questioned it. And all of them believed that the Lord Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I never heard the deity of Christ ever denied from any of those pulpits. And then they all believe that Jesus died for the sins of the world. Now, I don't know whether they believed he's coming back, because I never heard a sermon on that as a boy. If I did, didn't register with me. But I do know they all believe the same thing in these major matters. Now, they differed about free will and predestination, and they differed about baptism, whether you're to sprinkle, whether you're to immerse. 
And they differed on a few other little matters. Church government, how was the church to be run, whether you'd have deacons or whether you'd have the congregation run it or whether you'd have the elders run it. They all differed, you see, and disagreed on those minor points. But on the major points, they did not disagree. They all preached the gospel. Now, a lot of water's gone under the bridge in America since then. Hasn't been too many years, but I say it today kindly, but there are not many of those churches today that are preaching the gospel. What's happened? The Lord Jesus is still walking in the midst of the lampstand. He's still saying, you better repent, and if you don't repent, I'll come and remove your lampstand. Well, is he doing that today? Oh, yes, he is. These Protestant churches today have lost their influence. May I say that all these leaders are alarmed, and they're doing everything they can today to try to bolster it up and get the influence back and that sort of thing. And all these liberal churches, none of them have a Sunday evening service. If they do, they've either got to have potluck or it'll be a young people's meeting or a book review or a nice little song service. It better not be Bible because nobody will come there, you see. Well, they don't believe it's the Word of God anyway. So why have it? Just, well, have something else. May I say to you, the church has lost its influence. It disturbs me today about so-called fundamentalism. I see many breaches in the dike of fundamentalism. And I'll be honest with you. I see today fundamentalism where many of these denominations were 30 years ago. And it seems to me that unless fundamentalism repents, and I mean repent, this business of always pointing our finger to liberals and telling them they are wrong and we are right, I think we better get past that, friends. We are all wrong also. And unless fundamentalism repents and comes back to God, I think that Ichabod's written across the threshold of our work today. And that disturbs me because I know one thing. He's still walking among the lampstands. And you better not trifle with him. And if you think you're going to get by with it, my brother, my sister, you're wrong. We're dealing with a living Christ who's walking among the lampstands. And he's watching the light, if you please. Now, I think that we probably ought to read here for just a moment, verses 12 and 13. Now, I read these yesterday, but listen to them as I'm reading from our notes, our own translation. And I turned to see the voice which was speaking with me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands, one like to a son of man, clothed with a garment, reaching to the foot gird about the breast with a golden girdle. Now, I want to turn our attention very briefly here to the one who is the Son of Man. Now, I think that we're right when we identify him as the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure we are. Now, if you go back to the fifth chapter of the Gospel of John, and I probably ought to just turn up several verses here. In verse 25 of chapter 5 of John, I read, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Now, somebody says, but wait a minute. That doesn't say Son of Man. It says Son of God. Fine, let's keep reading. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Well, you say that hasn't said yet that he's the Son of Man. Let's keep reading. Verse 27, And he hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. The Son of God and the Son of Man are the same. John's very careful about that, you see. He wants to make sure that you and I understand that and that we know that, if you please. 